wonderful to see everyone. We're very thankful to be here, and I'm very thankful for this opportunity to present a portion of God's Word, and I very much appreciate the invitation of the congregation at Norman to be part of this great event. I love teaching about the family, and I enjoy very much having the privilege of watching families through the decades to be successful in the Lord, and it's an amazing, an amazing thing to witness when multiple generations of our families can be successful in their quest to serve the Lord and their children after them. We do not save all, however, and our hearts break with those children who make decisions that, that indeed just that, break our hearts. And we wonder, what have we done? What have we done that some would turn away from the God of the Bible? What have we done that some would turn away from the Lord's church? I do know that it's up to each one of us to decide who, will, who we will be every day. And the same truth that some choose to obey and dedicate their lives to, others choose to scoff and ignore. Last night, the lesson here, I saw the outline, the lesson here was about the Lord's church when 3,000 obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost. We do know, don't we, that that's not all who were there. There were more than 3,000 in attendance. Very likely, far more. Some said yes. Some said no. What do we want to do in our time? We want to influence as many as possible to say yes. And we want to influence as many as possible to stay faithful as long as they live. It was mentioned in the announcements that my sister just passed away. And she died in the Lord. And so that makes her death, because she was suffering with cancer, a tremendous relief for our family. And through our tears, we're so glad for her. But that cannot be said of those who turn their back on the Lord. That cannot be said of those who consider the the beautiful story of the cross and then scoff at its message and live in honor of Satan. And whenever individuals that we love who have turned their back on the Lord, when they pass away, our heart is filled with sorrow for what might have been. And I hope any time something like that happens, whether someone dies in the Lord or not, that our faith is renewed and that we are encouraged to say, I'm going to do this. I can do this. And with God's help and the help of those that I love, I can be successful in this life, going from this life to a home in heaven with God. Jesus said some amazing things in 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 There we go. Too far. No? Okay. We'll start there. Luke 21. Jesus said, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And he was speaking to his apostles about end time things. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilences. There will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. 
And so that is what we want to speak about for just a little bit. By your patience, possess your souls. In Luke 21, Jesus is speaking of end times. Specifically, he is speaking regarding the apostles and the destruction of Jerusalem that occurred before the end of the first century. And as we can read in this and other gospel accounts, this was going to be a chaotic time for the apostles. It was going to be a chaotic time for the church. There were going to be wars all around, earthquakes, famines, disease outbreaks, persecutions of Christians that included being put on trial for their faith, which resulted in imprisonment and death. In some instances, their own family members would turn against them and be active in revealing where they were to authorities who were searching for Christians that they might be put into prison, tortured, and killed. Generally, Jesus reveals they were going to be hated and despised for being Christians, for being followers of Christ. Then, in verse 18, Jesus said, not a hair of your head will be lost. Really? He has just said, you're going to be betrayed. Some of you will be put to death. Not a hair of your head will be lost. This is not the physical head of those he was addressing. This is a spiritual lesson. And it was to remind his immediate audience, the saved, of the hope of heaven. The destruction of a saint's body, says McGarvey and Pendleton in Fourfold Gospel, would work no real injury to him. And so those who were persecuted, Jesus is saying, there won't be any harm come to you. Oh yeah, you may die. Some of you will, but there's no harm. And then he says in verse 19, by your patience, possess your souls. Obviously, God was going to bless the apostles during this time. And we know that God promised and did what he promised to do. But the apostles had a responsibility as well. The apostles didn't just go on to automatic pilot with everything they did. They had things they had to do also, such as stay faithful to God. And when they didn't, they were corrected. As in when the apostle Peter went astray and the apostle Paul corrected him in front of everybody. Jesus is saying to the apostles, in patience, possess your soul. And that's a way of saying they were captains of their own fate, if you will. And that will sound familiar. Who saw the slide that was here just a moment ago? The poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley has been around for a long, long time. Perhaps you are aware of this and have studied it in school. I learned that the author is an individual who lived from 1849 to 1903. And he was born in Gloucester, England and he was diagnosed at a very early age with tubercular arthritis and he went through many years of pain and discomfort. He wrote this poem when he was in the hospital for his disease and he had just had his left leg amputated from the knee down. Here are his words. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now we, of course, correct some of the concepts in this poem. Whatever God's may be is not a true statement because there is only one God, the Lord God of heaven and earth. And we would also correct that the only certain fate after this life is the looming horror of the shade because we know that the promise of the hope of heaven awaits all who are redeemed. And Jesus himself promised in John 14 that he was preparing a place for us in his father's house. Nevertheless, the concept is one of he was going to determine the quality of his life. That was what he was going to do. He was going to determine the quality of his life, even and especially when life was at its worst for him. And I believe that's a message to us, that it can be up to us to decide how we will act and react to life circumstances, whether life circumstances are wonderful or whether they are the worst that we have ever seen. 
What is Jesus saying in our passage in Luke that was addressed to the apostles about the destruction of Jerusalem and those things that were about to certainly happen to them? He's saying that they too could decide, even with chaos all around them, they too could be victorious. They could control themselves within that time. It was within their ability. It was within their power to have God's approval. In other words, he was saying to them, you own this. You own this. This is on you. And that is the message that I want us to consider of some things that we own in our time. We own our part in our relationships with others. Regardless of what that relationship might be, it is ours to own. And so what are we, how are we, who are we in the eyes of others as a child? How are we as a child in the eyes of our parents? We are instructed to obey and honor Ephesians 6, 1 and 2, first commandments with promise. To obey and honor. Two simple words. Sound simple. Really hard. The obedience part can be done because you've just been punished. But the honor part, that comes from the heart. So obedience may come because parents are big and strong. But we grow up, don't we? Sometimes we're bigger than our parents, stronger than our parents. What are you going to do then, parents? The obedience part needs to be because the parents are someone to be followed. Then the honor part, well, I'll I'll illustrate it like this. Um, If you're a kid and you've been told to take out the trash, to obey is to take out the trash. To honor is to do so without rolling your eyes as you walk out the door. A lot of us have that eye roll perfected. At 66, I still have it. And my mama still knows. And so this honor thing and this obedience thing that we learn from the time we're knee-high to a grasshopper is what is to set the stage for who we are when we're not being watched. It's to set the stage for who we are as people out among others who do not have our values. It's to set the stage for who we will be when we grow up and we leave father and mother. It's to set the stage for who we will be when we enter into relationships and we enter into friendships. So who are we as a child in the eyes of our parents? Who are we as a spouse in the eyes of our spouse? There's so much with all of this. Our our marriages are intended to be filled with love and respect. And that is intended to teach our children who they are to be in their relationships. Our children learn how men treat women and how women treat men by what they see and observe and hear every day. And so who are we? How are we as a spouse? How are we as a parent in the eyes of our children? Are we in the Lord? That is our command. Not just because we're stronger, not just because we can wield a mean switch, But because we're in the Lord, we will have appropriate punishments for infractions and we will show our children the way to humble ourselves before God so that they might do the same. How are we as a neighbor in the eyes of our neighbor, as a worker in the eyes of our boss or our co-workers? We're to provide things honest and we are to work as if we were working for God. There should never be a Christian who is blamed by their boss as being lazy. That's just not right. Evangelists are told, do the work of an evangelist. And that's an example for the whole church. Elders are selected because they have a pattern of work among the congregation that is easily recognized and easily seen. And so it is when we go to our jobs, wherever that may be, we want to be an exemplary worker. Now, we may not do so well in our job, but we will work hard at it. And we will give it our best. And school is after that. What is it about us as a student in the eyes of our teachers? And for those who are in school, please know that school is your job. That is your job. And so do your best. And grades are not necessarily an indication of effort for everyone. 
Someone may get wonderful grades, but be a louse as far as everybody is concerned who's an authority figure in the school. That's not the way we're supposed to be. And so we cannot always look at grades and say, oh, they're a wonderful person. They're a wonderful example to everyone in the school. Not necessarily. That's on us. We own that. Now, I'm kind of a late college student. And so uh, I will say when I started to college at 50, I was a much more diligent student than I was when I was younger. So I do understand that the difficulties of some teachers, the difficulties of some classes, the difficulties of some material, but we're still to do our very best. How are we then as a friend in the eyes of our friends? If, if someone is our friend, it will be obvious. Someone who has friends has to be friendly. And then how are we in our relationships with others as a friend? Must someone be a certain race a certain size, a certain height, a certain income level in their home, etc., etc., before they will be fit to be friends with, with us? If so, we are so short-sighted. If so, we are so blinded by prejudice that it is just very, very sad. And we can be thankful that God does not do that. Anytime someone is in any way different, It's hard for them. It's hard for them. We naturally seek people who are at the same level as we are, whatever that level may be. That's how cliques are born, and sometimes those cliques become very, very wrong. Now, there's nothing wrong with having best friends and a circle of wonderful, good friends, but if that circle cannot include everyone, then there's something wrong with us, and we need to own that. We have to own that. And so it is, those who cannot hear still love to communicate. Those who cannot see still love to know what's in front of them. Those who cannot walk still love to take journeys. And so it is, everyone who may be just a little bit different is easy to shun. And shame on us if that's who we are. Because being a friend is what God does. When he doesn't look on outward appearances, but when he looks at hearts. As much as possible, we are to live peaceably with all mankind. And any verse that applies to a Christian and relationships between Christians starts at home. Now, there are a lot of specific verses about the home, but there are also a tremendous amount of verses about Christians behaving themselves in various relationships and how we are to conduct ourselves. That has to start at home. We don't get a pass at home on who we're to be as Christians. That needs to be where we practice these things and perfect these things so we can endure whatever may come at us from the world. And so we have some very hard sayings. One translation says, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Was that the scene as everybody got ready to come here tonight? <coughs> patience, gentleness, compassion kindness, humility, bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. That ever happened in a family? That someone has a grievance against someone? Of course it does. How are we to conduct ourselves? Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. It's the bond of perfection. And so we need to bear with one another. And it's kind of like when you live with somebody in a family, you get to know them, warts and all. And so it is, we get to know each other very, very well, and we know all the buttons to push so that we can upset this one, upset that one, etc. And we need to have our very best foot forward once we have an awareness that life exists beyond ourselves. And so it is... Whenever we consider those who we will be friends with, there is a saying that was first recorded in English, translated from the German, in 1573. 
He that goeth to bed with dogs ariseth with fleas. So this is a caution about our friendships. Our friendships that we have, even in the church, need to be with caution. Not everyone who is part of the Lord's church is a good person. Sorry. Not everyone who's outside the Lord's church is a bad person. But if we start spending our time and adapting the values of those who have nothing to do with the Lord, then that's going to tempt us greatly. And we'll end up with fleas. Fleas like worldliness. Please like wondering about the doctrine of the Lord's church. The New Testament puts it this way, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Haven't we seen that? Where someone gets in with a circle of individuals and get under their influence, and rather being an influence to them, they are influenced by them, and before we, before we know it, they're not who they need to be. And we can see them slipping, slipping, slipping away. And sometimes we have to say, I am not strong enough to have this friendship. I'm not strong enough to be part of this association with this crowd. I'm just not ready for that. And sometimes we have to have the strength to turn away. We own who we are. We own our relationships. We can have the strength to walk away. And regarding friendships, friendships come and go. Friendships ebb and flow. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, if this person were not my friend, how would they be treating me? And if the answer is, well, they'd be treating me just like they are, then they're not your friend. And if you've ever experienced that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When somebody starts treating you ugly, when they won't spend time with you uh, for no apparent good reason, when they don't return your texts for no apparent good reason, when they have no interest in what interests you, and they just seem to be too busy to be bothered by you, they're not your friend. Now, we intend to be in heaven with every faithful child of God. But that doesn't mean that we're going to hug every day with everybody that's in the Lord's church. Didn't Paul and Barnabas kind of prove that? And so if someone is a great friend, wonderful. Spend time, enjoy that. If they're not, don't waste your time. Please, turn to someone who loves having friends like you. Don't waste your time with people that push you out of a group in the Lord's church. Please. It can cause a it can cause decades of heartache. Okay. We can own our own faith. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 5 when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. There are three individuals named in this verse. Timothy's grandmother, his mother, and himself. And notice, if you will, that each of them possessed their own faith. No one can possess our faith for us. We have to possess our own relationship with God. It has to be according to his word. It has to be according to our assigned roles, 1 Corinthians 11. And we have to make sure that we're in accordance with God's rules for our role, for who we are. But no one can possess our faith. It is to be our own. Years ago, knocking doors, I asked a fellow a question like, do you have a religion? And he answered me, you know, I'll have to ask my mother what we are. And he meant that sincerely. He didn't know. But he knew that she knew. Now, what was he? He was nothing. He was absolutely nothing. And isn't that sad? And so, this faith that was in them was in each of them, and they were a great example for one another, but they had their own faith. 
Other Christians may encourage us, and hopefully they do. However, they cannot and must not be the source of our faith. Our faith has to come from where God says it comes from, by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Our faith must come from the Word of God. Now, together with many other young people, it's a wonderful occasion. Some of you will go back to home congregations where you're the only one of your age. You're not the first to have that experience. Many have through the decades. You still can be faithful in the Lord's church if you're the only one there of your age group. Why? Because our faith must come from the Word of God. And the things that are written in the Gospels are written that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we might have life through His name. And so these things are for us in the Word of God, which means we need to be actively pursuing the Word of God. If our faith wavers, we need to go back to the book. We need to go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We need to read again and again and again the story of Jesus Christ. We need to learn who he was, walk with him as he performed his miracles, listen to the struggles that he had, the temptation that he had going to the cross, be thankful for the death that he died for us. And we can renew our faith every day by looking in the word of God and we have no excuse for not having a Bible. Many people around the world still do not have a Bible in the language they speak. We, on the other hand, have so many Bibles, and now we can have them on our phones, on our tablets. We can have many versions of the Word of God at our fingertips very, very easily. But we can't absorb the Word of God just because it exists in an app, just because it exists in a book. We can't absorb the Word of God unless we actually concentrate on it. One site I recommend for study is studylight.org. It's a free site with extensive reference materials, including uh, many Church of Christ references, many word study references. It's an amazing site, but like everything that is not the Bible, be careful, because anyone who's written about the Bible is not inspired. And so you have to be careful. Look to see who wrote it. And then and only then, be careful. Don't, don't ignore what you know thinking you found something new. Take what you know with you as you're studying. Now, our faith. We encourage each other. And we're supposed to do that. We're to weep with those who weep. And we're to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're to love each other enough to correct each other when we're wrong, Galatians 6. We're to be really close as the family of God. We're to love the brotherhood. With that said, don't look to the side. Look only in front of you. What if that person tomorrow is no longer faithful in the Lord's church? What if that person in front of you is no longer faithful in the Lord's church, will you still be faithful? Now, for some of you, the person in front of you is me, and I acknowledge that. But let's think about it. I already mentioned an apostle who went astray, who corrected him, another apostle, dressed him down in public in front of everybody. That was the apostle Peter Did he straighten up? Yeah, he did. He repented of that wrong, and we know that because when he was an ordained an elder, as you might say, there were no outstanding warrants against him. And so we know we can make mistakes from which we can recover. We also know that people who are wonderful in the church one day are gone the next. Demas hath forsaken me, Paul said having loved this present world. And we never see Demas again in the scriptures. Through my decades in the Lord's church, there have been members, young and old, walked away from the Lord's church. Fathers who walked away from their families, mothers who walked away from their families and the church. There have been elders who walked away from the church. There have been gospel preachers faithful one day and gone the next. 
It does and it will happen. Which is why if our faith is based on any one individual, we have it in the wrong place. Our faith must be firmly based on the Word of God. And we must be encouraged by those who stay faithful even if we look around and no one else is. Can that happen? Yes, it can. It can happen in communities. It can happen in congregations. And it happened to Jesus. Everyone forsook him and fled in the garden. And yet he still went to the cross. And so are we willing to go the way of the cross by ourselves when others that we love turn their back on the Lord? And so it is, we can look sometimes to multiple generations of our families who have been faithful and we can be so thankful and we can be so encouraged by that. But some of us were raised by wolves and they, they were not faithful. Now you notice I started out with some verses about Timothy his mother, his grandmother. Do you notice that no men were mentioned? Not a man was mentioned in that at all. Not a father, not a grandfather, nobody. Whether we're the 10th generation of our family that's faithful in the Lord's church or the first, we still just must be faithful. Some here have probably known the heartache of a parent who leaves the Lord's church. What do we say about that? We say we love them, but we cannot go where they go. Some of us have suffered the heartache of children who have forsaken the Lord's church and grandchildren who've forsaken the Lord's church. What can we say to them? We love them with all of our hearts, but we cannot and we will not go where they have gone. We own our faith. We also own our own talent. The parable of the talents is that those talents were given to each according to his own ability. There were different numbers of talents. And so the individuals were given these talents and the good master went away and the individuals were left to use those talents. In this assembly, there will be individuals who've who've yet to serve the Lord in any capacity who will be better than most who do. If you can carry a tune, gentlemen, and you're a member of the Lord's church, and you won't lead a song, and you won't help in any way in the assembly, I do know and have been places where the leaders of the songs couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, but yet they would announce a song that's appropriate for the worship service, they would do their best to get it started, and the rest of us would sing along. While individuals very capable of singing, far, far better, sit there and say, no, not me, not me. And so it is, how are we going to use the talents that God has given us? This too starts at home. This starts at home. What talents do we have at home? My mother, growing up, thought I had the talent of washing dishes. She was wrong. (laughs) My sister and I had that chore. I know I'm old. We were raised for a good number of years without indoor plumbing. Some of you don't have a clue what that means. Others of you do. But that means that dishwashing was done in a sink and uh, it was a sudsy affair. And uh, my sister and I never emerged from that experience ever dry, never. We always had some reason to, uh, you know, to splash a little water on each other. What talents do we have? Whatever those talents are, are to be used at home, starting at a very, very young age. And then those talents are to be transferred into our lives and into the Lord's church. What we do with our talents in the Lord's church is not about all about public participation. Now, young men, when you participate in leading any part of the worship, please know it is an honor, it is a privilege, and it requires maturity to not detract from worship in the manner in which it is done. Ideally, 
no one remembers who led a song. Ideally, we remember the worshipful words and the pleasantness of raising our voices in song. Ideally, no one remembers who led the prayers, just that that prayer was spoken to God so sincere and in the name of Jesus so that we too could make it our prayer. And whoever teaches a lesson long after we've forgotten who did so, may we remember the principles of God's word that were presented lovingly to God's people. Using our talents in the Lord's church goes way beyond what we do in public. I held a meeting some years ago at a place and a brother had just moved to another congregation and we got there on, on, it was a Wednesday through Sunday meeting, we got there on a Thursday and the brethren said, Greg, it's hot in here, but we don't know how to, we don't know how to set the thermostats. Uh, the brother who did that just moved. And then a night or two goes by and they said, Greg, we don't know how much to pay the preacher for a meeting because the brother who did that, that same brother, just moved. I said, well, let, I'm sure we can figure that one out. You know, <laughs> the, the thermostats were going unset. You know, I didn't, I didn't. They missed that brother and they didn't even know all that he did. They didn't know half of what he did. And so what can we do? Ladies, young ladies especially, at what point do you own helping in any part of the church? If your church is going, to, if your congregation is going to have a meal together, must that always be mom's task? At what point does a young lady say, let me do something, let me cook something? At what point do younger people in a congregation say, I'll always clean up? At what point does someone say, how can I serve? At what point does someone, young man or young woman, say, let me take my turn doing things, whether it's making the loaf, cleaning the toilets, mowing the lawn. Somebody does all those things. At some point, we have to grow up and look beyond ourselves and say, how can, how can I help? How can I help? Now, there's a concept here that says when we do our charitable deeds, we're not to sound a trumpet as the hypocrites do. Can we do a good deed for someone without posting it online? I hope we can. Can we visit the lonely? Can we say hi to someone who people rarely speak to? How can we serve? At any age, it is an honor and a privilege to serve the Lord. The Christian is not forbidden to practice righteousness before men. What is forbidden is to make it his or her object to be seen. What is our motivation for helping others? Hopefully it's because we love the Lord and we love God's people. And therefore we want to see how can we help. Well, I, I, I need to stop here at this one. I'm sorry. Uh, young ladies, um, I did say something about mirror time. And I know I'm playing with fire. I know mirror time is very, very important. But when you look beyond the mirror, when you look yourself in the eye, who are you? And when you turn away from that mirror, is your world larger? Is it larger than yourself? You know, we start out very, very selfish. Very selfish. There's no one more selfish than a tiny baby. We circle back around to that when we get really old. And when you're, when you're just an infant, people think that selfishness is really cute. When you're really old, not so cute anymore. <laughs> Give me water. Where's my coffee? 
not so cute anymore. But when you interpret a cry as, oh, the baby needs to be changed, that's somehow cute, I'm told. Now, we can own how we help and who we are. Okay, we're going to plunge into an area that is very difficult, um, but we're going to talk about it. When I work with people before they're married, um, I tell them we can, we're going to talk about everything. We're going to talk about anything, and we're going to get through this. And so that's how this is as well. We need to own our standard of morality. And physical desire is to be seen as a gift from God. The Apostle Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he says each one has his own gift from God in this manner and another after that. The word gift that is in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 7 is normally associated with miraculous spiritual gifts, but that is not the case here. This is the natural gift of God for desire of intimacy and control of the same. And so the proper gift of God, according to John Edwards, is, is uh, control over one's bodily appetites and passions, and it will be extremely difficult for many individuals to have appropriate control. Some of that can be explained by information as is presented here. This is uh, men versus women at the age 12 through 25. The desire for men starts early, peaks earlier, and the desire for women uh, starts at about the same time, but peaks much later. And to complicate that, this is the age at which people get married these days, and in 2015, it's, near, it's 29 years for men and 27 years for women, and it has never been higher. And so we have individuals with desire and individuals who don't get married for longer and longer times. Now, what do we say and what do we see in this, uh, this graph about when development occurs? What it means for Christians is that men need to learn self-control in this area at a younger age than women. Men need to learn this lesson first. And God's solution for the gift of desire is self-control and marriage for those that are scripturally qualified to marry. 1 Corinthians 7 says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. So who is responsible for this self-control in dating? Who's responsible for this? Well, both. But who's responsible first? Gentlemen, that's you. That's you. You're responsible first. Why? It's a principle that's found in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, where we find husband and wife compared to Christ of the church. Christ is the head of the church and was willing to go first in all things, going the way of the cross for his bride. And so it is, gentlemen, that if we're going to walk in the earthly image of Christ, we need to be first in self-control. And it's like, well, but this desire, uh, yeah. Paul said to Timothy, let no one despise your youth, be an example in purity. That's what he's talking about. Timothy, you need to be an example in purity. So as we look further, there's a parallel that I hope can help with this because individuals say, well, I have this desire and it just needs to be expressed. It's like, well, let's look at the days of miracles, miraculous gifts. At Corinth, they had all these miraculous gifts and people thought, since I have a miraculous gift, I just have to express it. And this particular passage that I have on the board, I believe refers to what was going on in their worship. Everyone, men and women, who had a miraculous gift were expressing their gift in worship. You talk about a chaotic mess, it was. And Paul said, stop it. He said, ladies, you don't get to speak at all. And then he says that men, one at a time. But look at verse 32. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, he's saying, you don't have to use this gift. You can control when you use it. 
And so anyone with a miraculous spiritual gift was expected to behave themselves and use their gift appropriately. And I believe the same concept applies to the non-miraculous gift of desire. All who have the gift of desire are expected to behave themselves and use their gift appropriately. And so it is, young men, please do not use your gift of desire to attempt to manipulate young ladies in agreeing to behaviors that God only blesses in marriage. Men, that's on you. That's on you. Now you can have accountability buddies, and that's what I meant about the premarital studies. When I work with a couple, I'll say, how you doing? How you doing with your commitment to purity? How are you doing avoiding intimacy before you're married? Remember I said we're going to talk about anything and everything. And I've had couples look at me and say we've made some mistakes. And then we talk about that. And then I ask them, are you willing to make a commitment that we will discuss again in our time together to stay pure until you marry? And anyone who says no, I won't waste my time here. I've never had anybody say no. (laughs) I've had people relieved that someone would bring up a subject that was just eating them up with guilt. And they needed some help with it. And there was nobody they could turn to. At least they thought. Of course there were people they could turn to. But they felt all alone in that. Young ladies, you are amazing. God truly saved the best to last when he created Eve. You're the crown jewel of all creation. But when you use your desire and your beauty and your desirability at the wrong time you become just like Eve after her fall when she sought as a disciple of Satan to get her husband to be just like her don't use your beauty that way who you are in your body is a gift from God and God's solution to the gift of desire is marriage. Okay, that was hard. Uh, I know it was. We're going to move on to money. It's simple, right? No, it's not. Mistakes that you make with money at a young age will haunt you for decades if you're not careful. It's possible in a few brief moments to have so much debt in your life that you never see a way out. If you've not listened to Dave Ramsey, on his radio program or read any of his books. Spend 30 minutes listening to him. Once you've done that, you'll hear the same thing over and over if you listen every day. What he says is, from a biblical standpoint, don't make money your master. No man can serve God and mammon, the Bible says. Remember that? And so it is. This is a chart that talks about the net worth by age. It starts at age 35. Why does it start at age 35? Because at most of your ages, you have nothing. You have nothing. And if any, of you, if any of you go into a car dealership and buy a new car, the second you drive it away, your net worth is negative. Because you just lost a lot of money the minute you turned the key. It takes a long time to have much money. So how do we behave ourselves with money? Well, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of of the things that he possesses. Yet at the same time, we have an obligation to make a living and to provide. In fact, if those who are able don't, they're worse than an unbeliever. They're worse than an infidel, the old King James says. We need to be willing and able to provide for our families. I encourage everyone who can to have a great education, to use it well, to get wonderful jobs where you can serve God as a Christian within that job, 
And that gives the church the means to send the gospel around the world. How do you think the gospel has spread around the world? This is a hub of doing that. How has that happened? It's happened by families who are faithful to the Lord, who have good jobs and make a good income, and they're very generous and they're giving to the Lord's church. And by that means, there are thousands of congregations around the world. So I'm not saying just work at the least paying job you can find. Not at all. I'm just saying when we, when we start to make money, it has to be with a greater purpose. A greater purpose. And that greater purpose is to serve others. The church is to not be burdened when there are issues in our families. Families are to help first. And so there are many things that we can do if we have a good living. We also are to own our sin. Oh, this is hard. It's so easy for me to blame somebody else for the mistakes that I have made. If only this person, you know that, that story. You know how that goes. And so Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed Eve. That woman thou gavest me. You know, that really was blaming God. And that's what we do. When we start looking around for somebody to blame for our mistakes, we're blaming God. We own our mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we need to have a humble heart where we are willing to say, like David of old, I have sinned. And we need to be willing to do our best to recover from that sin with, our, with the rest of our days. And so it is... Our time now brings us to talk a little bit more about a life of sin. I'll tell you about a fellow who at your age, many of you, was a Christian and then decided that there were so many neat things out there, you know, the pleasures of sin for a season. And so he enjoyed most of them, drinking, drugs, multiple immoral relationships, driving under the influence, and ending up in prison for vehicular manslaughter. And through the years, he has struggled in and out of the Lord's church. And within the last few years, he has had the most years of faithfulness that I have known in the last 20 plus years that I have known him. He talked recently about his dreams. He said, I know the Lord has forgiven me. He said, I know I've made so many mistakes. And I know the Lord has forgiven me. But he said, I am haunted in my dreams by the mistakes I made when I was young. And he said, I can't stop the dreams. But here's what he has started doing. He started saying, when he wakes up from one of those nightmares, he prays to God with thankfulness for having survived. He's thankful to be alive. He's thankful to have survived all of those poor decisions and he's the most active person I have ever known in inviting people to the Lord's church and inviting people to his home for Bible studies and talking to people every day about the Lord's church and what can be there for anyone. One of these days, if the Lord wills, you will be my age or older and you'll get the pleasure perhaps of looking back on your life and when you're my age and you look back what do you want to see what do you want to see do you want to see a life lived of service to God do you want to see a life filled with mistakes that you just never cleaned up? What do you want to see? I hope you want to see that at a certain point, 
you said, I own my relationship with God. And I'm going to do my best. Now, we don't own our relationship with God in that we demand of God to accept us as we are. But we're responsible for who we are before God. And in the day of judgment, when the books are opened and the book of life is open, what does that mean? It means we will be judged out of who we have been. And that means each day that we live, we're telling the Lord where we want to go. And yet the Bible says, in our patience, possess our souls. That's what Jesus told his apostles. In our patience. And so it is just for today. Can we win a victory over Satan? Just for today, can we say no to a temptation? Just for today, can we do what we need to do? Help who we need to help? Can we do our best to serve the Lord? And so our soul is for us to win. It's not for us to walk in those things of the world. It is for us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And we can do this. We can be victorious. And Philip's translation of Luke 21, 19 says, hold on and you will win your souls. We don't know what's coming in life. It may be a wild ride. Hold on. We'll be okay. Not a hair of our head will be harmed. That has nothing to do with the hairs of our head. It just means no matter what happens to us in this life, we'll be okay if we will stay strong in the Lord. Perhaps I'm talking tonight to someone who's not yet turned their life over to God. Yes, we own who we are, which means we have the right to decide whether or not we're going to be a Christian. The Lord will accept all who will come to him, and he will accept all who obey him according to his word. In order for us to be a Christian, as was taught last night, it is necessary in order for us to, to be forgiven of our sins, to have faith, to repent of our sins, to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and then to be immersed in water for the remission of our sins. Perhaps there's someone tonight who's not yet taken that step. You own your right to do that. The Lord has blessed us with the freedom to make that decision, the greatest decision we will ever make in our lives. Perhaps there's someone here who is a Christian, but you've sinned of a public nature. Isn't it time that you got rid of that burden and that you allowed those who are here to pray on your behalf that you might be restored to faithfulness? There's one to obey the gospel or repent of wrong. Please come forward as we stand, as we sing.